So here's two classes. There's red stuff and there's blue stuff. And uh, I just pulled this off Wikipedia. I, like, I think it's a nice picture. Um, so if I want to say, you know, let's draw a line through the red stuff, you know, to separate the red stuff from the blue stuff. Well, clearly in this case, a straight line isn't going to do it. Okay. So you want to have a, you're going to have to have some kind of curvy line. But there's lots of different ways you can draw a curvy line. So here's one way of drawing a curvy line. This black one here. It's kind of nice and smooth. Um, and uh, it does a pretty decent job. But look, I don't know if you can see this. I think you can see this. Okay. The smooth line does a pretty good job. But some of the dots fall on the wrong side of the line. Okay. So if I say, okay, here's my smooth line here, and I'm gonna, and this boundary is gonna declare everything on this side is I'm gonna call a red dot. Everything on this side I'm gonna call a blue dot. Well, it gets this guy wrong. It gets this guy wrong. Gets this guy wrong. Gets this. Guy wrong. Okay. So, so you you've you've achieved a nice simplicity by having a nice smooth line. And you can't get smoother than the straight line, but this is fairly smooth too. But you've achieved it at the cost of actually getting a bunch of stuff wrong. This is a very, this is, this is almost like, this looks like a trivial example, but this is kind of the most fundamental fact about classifiers, probably, actually. Okay, the, um, okay but what about the green line here? Uh, the green line doesn't get anything wrong. Okay? The green line, it gets this guy right, because it has a little, a little kink in it to occur, and it has a little loop around this one. It has a little detour around this one. Every single red line, every single red point, is on the red side of the, of the, of the boundary. And every single blue point is on the blue side of the boundary. So it's perfect. Okay? It's the best possible divider of the blue and the, the red points, right? Okay, what, why is, what's the sense in which, in which the, um, the, uh, the green line is maybe not so perfect? So if the data changes in the future, a blue dot might appear right next to one of those red ones, but within the green boundary, even though exactly, it should be. exactly, exactly. Okay. So this is perfect for this particular set of dots, right? But um, you know, the assumption here, which is a pretty reasonable assumption, is that the little kind of subset of the world that we're seeing right now is not the whole world. It's just a part of the world. Okay. It's just a sample. Okay. And you, you have no reason whatsoever to expect, unless you happen to have some extremely good reason, like some, if you happen to know that this is the entire world, then that might not be a bad way of dividing up. Okay? But generally speaking, we don't get the entire world. We just get some part of it. And so you, you want to say, OK, I want, I want something that works not just for this little part of the world that I happen to be looking at right now, but works for the world in general. Okay, in general, it's just called generalization. You want to be able to generalize. You want to capture kind of underlying regularities and not get too hung up on particularities of, uh, of what happens to be going on in your particular sample. And so then, very nicely uh, put, this, this green line here has gotten extremely caught up in the particularities of what's happening in this particular sample. And you can well imagine that if any more dots come along which obey the same general rule, whatever it is, that the blue and the, the red dots have, the chance that these new dots are actually going to obligingly happen to fit to all these little curves and detours here is not that high. Okay. So now that's all just a kind of you know, verbal description, but there's ways of quantifying that. And you can imagine that basically your way of quantifying <coughs> that is basically saying, how smooth is my boundary? Okay. If you put a number, and you can imagine you know, a very simple way of counting it would be you know, how many how many kind of wiggles does it make? Okay, so you know the simplest a measure of smoothness, and you you know count a wiggle as I don't know like bending more than that much or something. Okay, so so you could put, you could quantify how smooth is this, how smooth is that? The smoother one is going to in general be the one that generalizes better, but it will do that at a cost of actually getting some stuff wrong, and you can't get smoother than the straight line. Okay, so um, so this this picture which you know I just pulled off Wikipedia actually kind of captures something very fundamental about the problem of classifying the world. Okay. And in fact, you know, there's a whole branch of research, it's called machine learning or statistical pattern recognition, which is devoted entirely 
to trying to figure out good ways to solve these kind of problems. Because we discussed there's a lot of things in real life, certainly done by algorithms and probably done by us too, which are basically problems of this kind. You know, so, uh, you know, I'm, I, if you're a, if Picasso is trying to fit, find the, the faces in the photos that you just uploaded, okay? It wants to find the faces, not just that are kind of looking straight on, but they might be looking to the side, you can only see one eye, or there might be a shadow, or the person might have sunglasses on, or they might have grown a beard, or they might have changed their hairstyle, okay? So it wants to capture something, but it can't just, you know, take some list of a thousand faces and say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, okay, this one has sunglasses, but I'll make a little side rule for, you know, if, if John Smith has sunglasses on, then, you know, he's still John Smith. Okay, that would be like, that would be like kind of drawing a little loop here. That's not going to help you when the next person comes along who isn't John Smith, but maybe looks a little bit like John Smith. Okay. So, um, so, the, so, so the, the, the question of how can you get as good a, a classification as you possibly can, make as few errors as you possibly can, but while staying as smooth as you possibly can and getting as good generalization as you possibly can, is it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that's the problem that's driving this entire field of machine learning, which has thousands and thousands and thousands of people working in it. And you know, Google and Facebook and companies like this are snapping up and buying and employing every single company they can find that does this kind of stuff. Okay, because they, they, they really want to solve these problems. Okay? So, so we're going to be looking at, um, uh, actually that last line is not an exaggeration, one of the main machine learning conferences, I don't know if any of you follow this kind of stuff, one of the main machine learning conferences is called Neural Information Processing Systems, and their guest keynote speaker recently was Mark Zuckerberg, who doesn't normally go to academic conferences, and, um, and the, yeah, they basically were going around hiring lots of people and almost certainly, you know, multiplying by some large number whatever they were getting paid as for their academic research job. In fact, it's actually very, very difficult for universities, including this, this University of Rochester right now is trying to hire some machine learning people. And, uh, and the, the last, I was chatting with uh, Henry Couch, who's the, the chair, and he's, he's telling me the last few people over the last few years they've tried to hire, most of them just get snapped up by, by Google because the, these companies are trying to buy everyone who, who has these kind of skills. So by the way, this is, uh, you know, even if you decide during the class that you have no interest whatsoever in the brain, you know, if you learn some of these classification skills, it's actually a highly marketable skill. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is what a classifier is doing. So here's another, here's another picture of that. This is, I think it's a little more intuitive in two dimensions, but here's a, here's a problem in one dimension. Okay, so, um, oh, that's my chair, someone's chair, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so um, so how do you stop this from happening? Okay, how do you stop how do you stop yourself from drawing a wavy line? Okay, well one way is you say, okay, I'm not going to let myself draw a wavy line. Okay, but that's that's you know it's hard to put a number on that. Okay, and you know if you're going to write an algorithm for something, you really need to put numbers on it. So um, so how do you put a number on something? So we kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but I didn't really get to. To, to dwell on it enough because it's important. So a very good way of doing it is, uh, and this is reflected in the, the very nice uh, comment that Adam gave, is if you find something that seems to work for what you have right now, if extra stuff comes along, you want to see if it's going to work for that too. Okay? So, so what's, the, what's the stuff we have right now? That's what we call the training set, and the extra stuff, that's called the testing set because you're going to test on it. Um, so here's, here's the example from... Uh, from that uh, Norman, Haxby, and others uh, review paper. So you say you've got three runs of data, where a run in fMRI is just, you know, you scan someone for maybe like six, seven minutes, and then you give them a little break, and then you scan them again, and then you give them a little break, and then you scan them again. So each of those little scans between the breaks is called a run. So, so you might, so a perfectly good way of, so, you, so uh, of chopping up your data. So cross-validation is chopping your data up into little pieces, and using most of them for training, saying let's try and fit the pattern in this, and using a little bit of it for testing and saying, let's see whether the pattern that we fit for this still succeeds when we get extra stuff. Okay? And then you might say, well, I don't really want to, um, you know, there's nothing really special. I happen to pick this particular piece for you know, being testing, but 
you know, there's nothing magical or special about this piece, so why am I using this bit for testing? Well, in fact, you don't just use that bit for testing. So, so if you were going to, say, split your data up into three bits, generally speaking, what you'd do is you'd do it three different times. So you'd say, first time I'm going to use these two guys for training and this guy for testing, and then I'm going to use these two guys for testing and this guy for uh, training, and this guy for testing, and then these two guys for, for training, this guy for testing. So you kind of chop it up and rotate around the little section that you use for testing, and that's called cross-validation. And so you might hear, you'll see, when you start to use papers, you'll see things like, say, threefold cross-validation. And all that means is, that's just a jargon way of saying, I chopped it up into three bits, and I kind of ran through the cycle three times. And each time, I used one of the bits for testing and the other two for training. And, um, and you can also have you know, tenfold, where you chop it up into ten bits. And you can also have leave one out cross-validation, where uh, you know, if you have 100 bits, you just uh, 100 say, uh, data points, then you just you know, use 99 for training and you just leave one out for testing and then you cycle that round. The more you chop it up, the longer it takes to run your algorithm. Okay. So, uh, um, okay, so here's, another, here's an example of that. So, can you, are these color differences clear here? Okay, so, so the training data is blue and the testing data is red. So imagine you can only see the blue dots. Okay. So these all actually have, these pictures, despite the lines being different, they all have the same dots in every time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so if you say, okay, I'm going to try and draw a line that goes through the blue dots. Well, this line, this is you know, the same example, but in 1D. This line goes perfectly through the blue dots, but it misses the red dots by a mile. This one kind of misses everything a bit. This is too smooth. You, know, you can be you can be too smooth. This is you can this is like treating the cat and the mouse like as if there were two coins, right? This is ignoring ignoring the real complexity of all. This is like the spherical chicken, and this is kind of the right amount. So this is actually a really difficult problem, trying to say how much is you know it's like the Goldilocks problem. Okay, how much is too smooth? How much is too non-smooth? And how much is just the right amount? And can I find that? You know, can I? have an algorithm that finds that for me without just having to kind of eyeball it. Because you can eyeball it in one dimensional, uh, you know, two dimensional plot. You can't eyeball it when you have a thousand dimensions. Okay? So cross-validation helps you to find, find the right point there where uh, um, you say, just as you have the red dots and the blue dots, you say, okay, I want to see, you know, I'm going to get my best fit on the training set, but I don't really know. I could get a perfect fit, just like I can draw a wiggly line that goes through all the dots. But I really don't know how good that is until I try it on some new stuff. And that's my test. That's my, that, that my testing set. If I do well on the testing set, then I know that I, I, I'm on the right track. Okay. So, uh, and if you, if you do really, really well on the training set, but not very well on the testing set, that tells you that you're overfitting. That's like drawing a wiggly line that goes through all the points. It seems like you're doing well at the time, but in fact, new stuff comes along and you're not doing too well. Um, okay, so in fact, uh, overfitting actually happens a lot in everyday life. This is, I just pulled this example off the web, but, uh, but this is kind of a nice example. Uh, can you read this from the back here? Is this really readable at the back, more or less? Okay. So uh, the Redskins rule, I, I know that, sorry, that's not, a, they, I guess they're going to change their name, but that's their name right now. Okay. Though the Washington Redskins may not have the most stellar record in the NFL, when it comes to predicting presidential elections, they are practically undefeated. Since 1936, the superstition, no superstition, that's actually an interesting story, okay, has held that if the Redskins won their last home game before the election, the incumbent party would stay in power. And that role held until 2004 when both the Redskins and Gary Kirill. So from somehow, amazingly, from 1936 to 2004, which is a lot of presidential elections, the Redskins predictor succeeded every single time. Okay? And then, then suddenly it didn't. Okay? So this is, this is classic overfitting. Okay? The, uh, and you know, this is, I mean, this article is obviously written kind of tongue in cheek. But if you were actually, you know, if you were actually to try and explain what, what exactly is wrong with using whether the Washington Redskins you know, win at home to predict the presidential election? I mean, apart from the fact that it seems kind of silly, but if you say, well, what, you know, beyond it kind of seeming kind of silly, what exactly is wrong with that? It's actually kind of not that easy to say, but what, you know, I, what's actually wrong with it is it's overfitting. Okay? It's because it's taking 
there's a million, million patterns out there in the world, okay? It's hunting around for lots and lots and lots and lots of patterns, and then, oh, I found one that happens to fit, okay? This is just like, um, where is this picture? Okay. This is just like saying, okay, I'm trying to find something. The, the, blue, the blue dots here are like presidential elections, and the wiggly line is like, you know, Washington Redskins, um, Washington Redskins success at home or whatever it was, a predictor. Okay, so you say, okay, well, you know, what about the success of, you know, the Dallas Cowboys? Well, that doesn't seem to fit. What about this, you know, what about whether it rained on the day before the election? Well, that doesn't seem to fit. Cycle through lots and lots of things. Eventually you say, oh, I found one that fitted. You know, I can draw my wiggly line just through here. Okay, um, but it's not actually predicting anything at all, just as this wiggly line is not really telling you anything about where the, the red points would be, but this one's doing a much better job. So, and in fact, actually, this is what superstition is in general. Superstition can best be understood, well, at least superstition can well be understood as overfitting. Okay? Superstition is when you notice some kind of pattern, and unfortunately, our brains are actually, well, kind of fortunately, but kind of unfortunately, our brains are very wired to find patterns. Okay? And you know, we're going to be looking for patterns in the brain. Our brains look for patterns in the world. But if you look for patterns, you can very easily end up doing this. Okay? So people say, you know, I was walking through the parking lot one day and I, you know, this morning and, and I, I, I dropped my keys and I picked them up and I looked at the license plate of the key of the car next to me and it was my birthday. So what are the odds? Okay? Now, if you, of course, in a certain sense, it is very surprising that, you know, it was your birthday, okay? but just as you kind of, you know, uh, happen to like, you know, you're kind of focusing on particular, particular parts of the data here, but kind of ignoring a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you're ignoring all the times that you dropped your keys and you looked at the license plate and it wasn't your birthday and you didn't think about it and you forgot. So, uh, so over focusing on particular aspects of the data is basically overfitting what drives uh, superstition, what drives that Redskins rule, and that's the problem that classifiers have to deal with. Uh, and um, the sort of this is actually kind of sort of what what happens in science too. So if any of you follow this kind of thing, there's a lot of discussion these days about uh, problems with replication in science. In fact, there was actually a very nice Nature News piece article about it today. Actually, when you saw it, or yesterday maybe. Uh, so. It's not, I mean, this is a little bit stretching the metaphor, but it's not that ridiculous to think of replication as a little bit like cross-validation, okay? Because uh, cross-validation is chopping the, the world up into independent bits and trying to make sure that what happens in one bit, namely the trains there, also happens in the other bit. The fact that they're independent is very important. If they're not independent, you're not doing it right, okay? So um, that's kind of what replication is, too. Someone says, I found the most amazing result. Uh, and uh, you know, it's p is less than 0 0.001, so it must be right. Uh, I found that. Um, have any of you been like following any of the stuff about the problem with replicating results in social psychology and priming research? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's kind of interesting. So there, there's, recently, there's been like volumes of journals. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. dedicated to actually, I think it was like I uh, recently came across it. Just dedicated to priming. It was That's in, right. It was in uh, perspectives. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, see, yeah, yeah. you get that in the mail as well. Well, I, I like I read you know stuff yeah. about it. But, yeah, it's like uh, a yeah, whole yeah. A whole volume just dedicated to yeah. priming. Yeah. yeah. So um, so okay, so so uh, there's a number of kind of well-known results in psychology. But uh, here's a striking one: um, that uh, you give people a bunch of um, of words to read. Uh, just, you know, you tell them you're doing some kind of, you know, like memory test or something. Uh, and some of the words are things that are kind of related to, like, old people. Like, the words like, you know, retirement and Florida and, you know, uh, I don't know, walking stick and things like this. Okay? And, uh, and then you say, okay, thank you very much for participating in my memory test. Uh, the, the door's that way, you know, thank you, have a good day. And then the, the, the subject walks out. But unbeknownst to them, you're timing with a stopwatch how long it takes them to walk out the door. Okay? And, um, and it's very, very striking. This result, this paper's been cited thousands of times, literally. 
very striking result that people found, some researchers at Yale, uh, found that uh, if you give people just a regular list of words, you know, they walk out at such and such a speed. And if you give people a list of words that kind of unconsciously primes this idea of old people in their head, they walk out more slowly. Okay? And you're like, wow, okay, this means that there's some really hidden, subtle thing that can actually drive my behavior in a very concrete way. It literally makes me walk slow without me noticing at all. People had no idea that, uh, that they, um, uh, that there were, you know, there were a lot of like age-related words in the list. It was just a list of words. They didn't even notice that, you know, there was like Florida and retirement and stuff. Because there's all kinds of other words that are not age-related in there. It's all in the mix. So this is kind of interesting, right? That if, uh, if you know, like unconscious processes can can have a big impact on your behavior without even noticing. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, anyway, recently people have because this is a very high, you know, these and other results are very high profile. Other people have like, oh, hey, okay, you know, let's do that experiment too. And then suddenly it doesn't seem to work as well. This is still up in the air. No one has really decided, but it currently kind of looks as though maybe it doesn't replicate. So, you know. so what, what, is, what is replication? Replication is saying, I've got one chunk of the world, namely this experiment. I've got another chunk of the world, namely some other experiment. It has to be an independent chunk. It can't be just the same people doing the same experiment again. Okay? It's got to be some other people doing it, or preferably in a different place, because it has to be independent. Uh, and, uh, and then you see if the same thing happens. Okay? So you can think of that as cross-validation in real life. So when you think, so cross-validation might sound like a very abstract concept, and you know, the generalization of a classifier might sound like a very abstract concept, but it's really just making sure that some, some underlying regularity that you think you've found really is an underlying regularity. Uh, and if you have, if you if you succeed in finding that, I mean, we looked at this picture before, but it might you might see it with maybe like slightly new eyes now. If you really have found an underlying regularity, then when new stuff comes along, you're going to do well. You will have found something that's true in general. You'll be generalizing. Okay. So if I'm trying to, I don't know how well you can see these dots here, but if I'm trying to decide whether something is a blue dot or a green dot, okay, a nice simple line will do a pretty good job. And if some new dots come along, I'm going to say that everything that's in this blue area, I'm going to call blue. And everything that's in this green area, I'm going to call green. But the price you're willing to pay for that is you're willing to get this one wrong, and you're willing to get this one wrong. And if you decide, oh, I would like to get this, you know, I'd really rather get this one right, actually, then you can draw a little, you know, little detour around here and a little detour around here. But now you're going to greatly reduce your ability to generalize, because now everything that happens to be in the detour, from now on, you're obliged to say is going to be blue. But um, you know, probably this was just a bad measurement or something. So, uh, so that's what happens in uh, in classifiers. So, uh, so that was one question. One other question was what was over fifty. Oh yeah, what else? the other question was what uh, what is a feature? Um, so features are just the uh, are just the um, the dimensions that go in here. So in, in this case, the features are height and weight. In, in, in this case here, the features were you know, little grid pixels on your computer screen that draw either an M or a W. In, in fMRI, the features are typically, don't necessarily have to be individual voxels. And feature selection is trying to pull out the features that you think are most useful and most important. So for instance, if your features are, if your task is decide someone's risk in uh, for getting lung cancer, and your features are number of cigarettes pack, uh, smoked per day, income, and I don't know, you know, the letter of the alphabet that their name begins with. Okay, some of those features will be assigned very high ways, and you will select them. So you would do a pretty good job at that task if you just throw away people's income information, or maybe their income information, and definitely which letter of the alphabet their name begins with, and you only just look at how many cigarettes they smoke per day. You'll actually probably do better than if you try and somehow figure out the correct, correct weight to assign to you know, the letter of the alphabet that someone's name begins with. Because you might happen to have some weird sample where you know, Zach and, um, and Virginia get cancer, and Adam and, uh, and um, Brenda don't get cancer. Okay, you might just have some weird sample where the letters seem like they mean something, but actually they don't. Uh, okay. So, um, 
So does that does that feel like it made made classifiers a little bit less mysterious? Okay. So because it's very very easy for uh, we'll, I, I put this up so no one's trying to read this slide, but uh, uh, um, it's very easy for this kind of stuff to seem very kind of magical and, and technical, especially if you look at some of the papers will have you know like equations in them that. But most of these equations are just taking a weighted sum of things, and then they might be taking a weighted sum and putting it through some kind of threshold, like you know which side of the boundary am I? And they might even be taking that weighted sum and making and putting some kind of curve on it like this. But that's all they're doing on the whole. Um, and uh, there's all these jargon terms like overfitting, cross-validation, feature selection. All it's doing is basically pulling out the important stuff and trying to find underlying regularities. So, um, so one, one thing that all of these approaches have in common is that they're not just looking at one single thing. They're usually looking at multiple things. Okay? So just like if I'm, just, you know, if I'm trying to tell the difference between uh, the letter W and the letter I, if I just look at one single thing, namely how much ink is there right here, I'll do fine. But for many, if I'm looking at the difference between M and W, just looking at that one single thing isn't going to do it. I've got to look at multiple things, namely the pattern across you know, 100 pixels or something. Okay. This one here is looking at two things, namely your position along this axis, your position along that axis. In fMRI, looking at just one single thing would be saying, what's the amount of activation intensity here? Is it high or is it low? Looking at lots of things together would be saying, what's the activation across a whole bunch of voxels? Is it a pattern that looks to be of this sort or a pattern that looks to be of that sort? Now, it turns out this is actually a very general phenomenon as well. So, you know, I was saying how like, uh, companies are trying to buy, uh, um, you know, hire people who, who do classifiers these days. And then actually, genetics, the situation in genetics, which I'm you know, totally not an expert about at all, but uh, is, um, is actually quite analogous to the situation in fMRI. So you know how we talked in one of the early classes about there's this tendency for people to say, what is the brain area for X? Okay, well, you know, what's the part of the brain responsible for solving crossword love, uh, puzzles or being in love or you know, um, being, having leadership qualities or whatever it is? Okay? Well, often, and this also happens, comes up, you see this in newspaper headlines a lot too, people say, what is the gene for disease X? And you still see headline so you know the gene for you know the gene for I don't know becoming wealthy or something right okay so it turns out that actually for almost nothing there are some things there really are some things which for which there is a gene for for X so for instance Huntington's disease which is a very horrible neurodegenerative disease that no one knows how to cure right now there's actually one <coughs> gene for it and uh, there's actually a test for that gene too, and um, people who are at family risk for Huntington's disease sometimes choose not to have that test because it's kind of not very nice to like know it because there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, but there is, but there's a very good and very predictive test because there is just a gene, as far as people know, for Huntington's disease. But most things are not that simple. Okay, just as there, uh, there, you know, maybe, maybe there's a brain, you know, the part of the brain responsible for, say, I don't know, uh, if I said, what's the part of the brain responsible for detecting bright edges? Well, there's actually several parts of the brain a little bit, but there's at least one, there's at least one part that really, really does that a lot, primary visual cortex, and you say, okay, that's a useful answer. But if I say, what's the part of the brain responsible for solving crossword puzzles, there's lots of parts of the brain all working together. Okay? So it's kind of like this in genetics, too, just as if the, this is as no for most things, there's no individual gene for, um, for it. So, so, you know, what's the gene responsible for getting lung cancer, okay? Well, if there was one gene for that, it'd be a lot easier to cure lung cancer than it actually is. There's probably lots and lots of genes that are involved in that. Okay. So, so you have to screen lots of genes together, and then you have lots of variables, and then and what do people do? They actually, this is a big uh, thing these days, they take they take these, these data sets and they put them into classifiers and they say, try and find some patterns in this. And they have all of these same problems of, you know, try to find patterns of generalize that are true not just for the 25 patients who we happen to, you know, collect data from, but for people, for human race in general. And so in fact, actually, this, uh, 
this picture here, this is not from an fMRI paper, this is from a, a cancer genetics paper, but it could be from an fMRI paper. Okay, it's exactly the same form, so it could be from any type of paper that you specify. And, um, and I kind of like this picture. So this is actually the reference. Uh, and I say this as if I read Nature Reviews Cancer all the time. I mean, I don't know anything about cancer. Uh, but, but what's nice about this is that this picture could come from, you know, this picture. Uh, you'll find identical pictures in, in, in fMRI papers or in any type of study that looks at classification. So look, these, these are looking kind of familiar, right? You've got like, here's your linear classification boundary. Here's your nonlinear classification boundary. Um, here's overlapping data sets, right? We were looking at that before. Okay. And in particular, it says, this the, the title of the paper is the property of high dimensional data spaces. What does that mean? It means you've got lots and lots of different things. Okay, so you know, in, in the case of uh, a multi-voxel study, it's high dimensional, meaning that you might be looking at a thousand voxels at the same time. Okay? And each one is an individual source of information, so that's the sense of a dimension. It doesn't mean in the kind of spatial sense. Um, so, uh, and it's quite difficult. Have you ever heard the phrase, the curse of dimensionality? No. What that means is um, that as soon as you have lots and lots of different sources of information, life gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. Because, you know, for why? Well, because for a start, because you have to you have to try and figure out which bits are important for feature selection. Another start is, uh, you know, another reason is, okay, if I just have two dimensions, you know, I've, what's my space to search through? Well, I can kind of search through a two-dimensional space. It's not that bad. What if you have a thousand-dimensional space? There's a really, really, really big space. You can't just, like, exhaustively look through all of that space. It would take you forever. Okay, this is a very big, big problem in these kind of areas. Okay, so, um, and then all, all kinds of interesting and difficult problems. You have to have some way of, of deciding you know, how similar are things to each other in this high dimensional space. And there could be more than one way of, of determining that. So, so this, basic, this basic question of what is a classifier, what is it doing, when would you need to use a linear decision boundary, uh, when would you uh, not need to use a linear decision boundary, why might a very flexible boundary hurt you? Why might you need it? Uh, you know, you, you can try drawing a straight line between the red dots and the blue dots here, and you're not going to have too much success. Okay? So sure, by all means, have the simplest possible boundary, but not too simple. Okay? If you try and draw a straight line here, you're great. If you try and draw a straight line here, you're never going to get any, any good. But it doesn't mean you have to have an extremely loose and flexible boundary, you can have, you know, this is a fairly simple one. This looks like it's maybe just like a part of an oval or something like that. Okay. So, um, so that's, that's what classifiers do, and those are, the, that in uh, kind of, you know, hopefully somewhat concrete intuitive terms is, is the basic problems that they're dealing with, and, and some of these, some of these kind of seemingly technical sounding terms like cross-validation, linear, non-linear. Um, and you know, much of the rest of the course is going to be looking at what happens when you take classifiers and try and use them to understand your old data. And not just from the point of view of, you know, hey, we're crunching numbers, but from the point of view of can we use this to understand your representations. Uh, um, any, uh, I'm, I'm almost completely sure that there's some parts of that that are probably not very clear. But just as nobody wanted to, well, I guess you've all studied you know, linear regression, but no one said, well, I, I, guys have not been posting very much on Piazza, which is totally fine. But I think the, the thing that it would be most useful for, I would recommend, okay, is if you have some question that you're kind of a little bit embarrassed to ask. I, I can say with some confidence that probably many of you right now have a little question that you feel a little bit uncertain about, but you kind of don't want to, like, you know, stick your hand up in front of everyone and say, I don't really get this because, you know, they might be like, what? You don't get that? What are you? What's wrong with you? Okay. But, uh, but in fact, actually, probably everybody else has the same question too. Okay, but nobody, you know, but nobody's saying it. Okay, so, um, so if there's something that's not clear, and I would be really, really very surprised if there are not some, if, if everything's perfectly clear, because I, I'm quite certain I haven't done a perfect job explaining it, and that's for sure. And and you know, some of this stuff is 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 quite new, probably. So, um, so if you have something that's a little bit unclear. Uh, a very, very, and I would totally welcome this, a very good thing to do would be just post it anonymously on Piazza, and then no one will ever know that you, and, and I bet you anything that a bunch of other people would be like, oh, I'm so glad somebody asked that, 
uh, because I didn't really get that either. And the advantage of posting it, well, there's two advantages of posting it publicly rather than just emailing me. Well, first of all, it's kind of a little bit harder to email me anonymously. I suppose you could if you, you know, signed up for some service. Um, but second of all, you know, probably everybody else has the same uncertainty too, and they would, they would like to see the answer too. So I would encourage that. I mean, it's also because possible that everything's perfectly clear to everybody, but I, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you very much. done some analysis before, but I really just ran scripts. And, uh, right. And, you know, and, uh, and which is a perfectly good way to start. I mean, you probably had this slightly uncomfortable feeling of like, what's going on in the black box? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's like how many, I'm just wondering if you're talking about the dimension, so like, uh, talking about pattern uh, analysis, like how because you know right now it's very really represented like conceptual yeah. symbols that you get. The, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, but, but this really was yeah. not yeah, it's, it's hiding but, uh, any of the reality. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that really is what's going on. Yeah, I think. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. But yeah. I think we need like for that whole data like yeah. how like, multi-dimensional is real math. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's very common to put in, you know, hundreds of voxels, yeah. thousands of voxels. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and uh, so one and so so that gets into my difficulties is like. Um, I'm just saying myself, this has to get really complicated really quickly. Well, not necessarily, because uh, look, if you're using, for instance, a uh, classified, and all it's doing is just, you know, assigning a weight to each voxel and just explicitly not looking at the interaction between yeah, the right. voxels. And uh, it's kind yeah. of an interesting fact about the brain, and I think this requires explanation. I don't think anyone has a very good explanation. Yeah. Is that the brain is definitely, definitely a very non-linear thing. There's nothing right. more full of interacting stuff than the brain. Right. So how is it that you know these linear classifiers, which explicitly ignore that, 